Thank you, uh, LAO. Any comment on that item? We've, re we've reviewed the proposal, and while we don't think that the resources being requested are unreasonable, it's two limited term positions, it, given that the universal assessment tool is a big lift, and as described before, there are a lot of steps to go with the planning before the tool is adopted into CMIPS, it's unclear exactly how these positions will be used in the meantime. So we do concur with the staff, the staff recommendation to hold this open as the department provides clarification. Thank you. Department of Finance. Okay, thank you. Um, we are gonna now move to proposals for investment. Uh, we're gonna have the IHS coalition. Uh, they're gonna come forward to present. Yes, anyway. uh, on the proposals for investment. So do, are they identified? How are we gonna do this? Um, I don't know if there's people prepared to present on these proposals for investment. Um, I think, uh, okay, good. And again, there's a number that are enumerated here starting on page 26 of the agenda. Um, and to the extent that some of these have been addressed in some detail, I'd ask uh, presenters to be succinct and if we've covered some of that ground to just underscore that. Um, and do you have a prepared order of presentation? Do you want to kind of guide? Uh, We're on three different issues. Okay. <laughs> Uh, there's one each of us on three different issues, so it just depends on the order that you want. One is on uh, the repeal of the 7% cut, one on the uh, share of cost buyout, and the other one is CMIPS proposal, sorry. So whatever your pleasure is, we can do it in whatever order. Okay, well, looking at our agenda at page 27, um, I think one of the first issues identified is the restoration of the IHS S share of cost. So why don't we begin with that? That's me. Okay, good. <laughs> uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Deborah Doctor from Disability Rights California. Um, for a couple of hours this morning, you heard from people who are asking you to restore funds to SSI and telling you how hard it is impossible to live on $889 a month. The people I'm here to speak about have $600 a month to live on. These are people who have income above SSI, but because of certain rules for them to be able to uh, get on the IHSS program for which they are qualified as far as need, they have to pay a share of cost which brings their income down to $600 a month, the medically needy level. So these are people, this could be somebody with a work history who's collecting social security of maybe $1,200, $1,300 a month. I'm somebody with a small pension and small social security. And it used to be up until, for many years, up until 2009, there was this thing called the share of cost buyout. Um, and there's some, you know, history which I'll skip, but the impact of it was that the state kind of made up the difference so to speak, so that those folks still had to pay a share of cost, but they had to pay it down to the SSI level, which was hard enough. Then that buyout got taken away, and these folks have to live on $600 a month, so considerably less than SSI, even though they worked, they had an expectation of maybe being a little more comfortable than people on SSI, and that was taken away. So insofar as it is impossible for somebody to live on SSI, 
it's hard for me to imagine how anybody exists on $600 a month for all their expenses. One of the implications of this is that um, it makes it very hard for somebody to exist in the community. It makes going into a nursing home more likely, I believe. And for somebody who's in a nursing home and wants to get out, the prospect of living on $600 a month is more than daunting. It's, I mean, I don't know where you get to live and pay rent or housing and eat and all those things on $600 a month. I believe that the state is, uh, that it's costing the state money to house people in institutions who could be cared for at much less expense and much more happily at home, but they can't do it if $600 is what they have to live on. So that's what I wanna say about it. It was one of those cuts made in bad times, and I think it is the time for the legislature to reconsider that and bring back this uh, level of humanity um, for lack of a better word, if there's no dignity at $889 a month, what is there at 600? Thank you. Thank you. Could you just explain briefly how the share of cost to buy out works? Uh, well, it doesn't, it didn't, it doesn't, it doesn't function at all now, but the way it, right. the way it uh, used to work was that, um, but, I'm gonna go back a little bit. Before, uh, IHSS wasn't always a federally funded program. Uh, and one of the conditions for getting federal funding was people having to qualify at a uh, medically needy level, to follow all the Medi-Cal rules as well as the IHSS rules. And Eileen will correct me as I will probably get this wrong. Um, but a, a kind of a promise was made a long time ago that people who were on IHSS would not be disadvantaged by this enormous influx of federal money, that they would be held harmless, meaning that they would have to pay share of costs down to the SSI level, which is what they had been doing previously. Now, there are programs that some of these folks can qualify for, which mean they don't have to pay for down to 600, but there are still some people. And what happened was that the state kind of paid the difference between the SSI um, level and the medically needy level. But I acknowledge that there were other costs assigned to it. We have not been able to find out what it would cost to restore this benefit. So I can't offer you any figures from that. All we have are the figures from 2009 when this benefit was taken away. And there were two or three different estimates of what the state would save by taking it away. I don't know whether those were the actual savings and and it's, um, I don't know how many people uh, are in this situation now, but I'm, um, asking on behalf of any of them um, for it to be restored. Thank you, and that's something you've helped us put a spotlight on. Uh, we're gonna move to the CMIPS2 reprogramming for additional hours in the Coordinated Care Initiative. Yes, welcome. Hi, so that's that's my issue today. Um, good afternoon, I'm Kim Rutledge with UDW, AFSCME Local 3930. And the issue that I'm gonna be bringing to your attention this afternoon, um, we are actually, I'm representing a whole coalition that is in agreement on this issue, along with SEIU California, Disability Rights California, Congress of California Seniors, and the California Association of Public Authorities. Um, so what this issue involves is going back to 2012 when the Coordinated Care Initiative was established to integrate all aspects of healthcare and long-term care services, including IHSS, into managed care for those who are dually eligible for Medicare and Medi-Cal and other Medi-Cal beneficiaries in seven pilot counties. Um, I think that way earlier in this hearing we were talking about some other CCI issues. Um, the CCI statute indicates that the 
includes a provision that managed care health plans can provide services to authorize and pay for extra home care services um, beyond what IHSS covers. So if an individual has the maximum number of IHSS hours a month, 283, and a health plan comes in and sees an assessment and says, oh, this person needs more than that, or maybe needs a different home care related service that's not included in IHSS, um, a health plan can authorize and pay for those additional services. However, in the statute, the managed care plan is prohibited from paying a provider directly. So they would either have to contract out through a home care agency or something like that. There's no provision in the CCI legislation that allows the individual provider to be paid to um, give these extra services. So um, when this happens so far, as far as we're aware, the health plans aren't even adding this additional service. And um, if they wanted to, they would have to bring in an outside provider, which disrupts the continuity of care that these really medically needy individuals who might need these extra hours need. So what we're requesting is for the CMIPS 2 system, which is the payroll system that handles um, all IHSS provider pay, um, be programmed to be able to take these payments directly from the managed care plan and be able to use CMIPS 2 as a conduit to pay the individual provider. Um, this will allow CCI to have this added provision that um, would really benefit these seniors and people with disabilities, these dually eligibles, and it also maintains the continuity of care and allows the provider to continue to do the job that they're already used to doing and be paid for those extra services. Um, so as we have discussed throughout this hearing, um, we understand that the CMIPS 2 system has to undergo a lot of changes to make over time work um, and um, to make the universal assessment work. I mean, these are, these are ongoing issues that we're working with the department with already. And we believe that, you know, while they're already doing this programming and this change to CMIPS 2, that this is just one addition that they can add to it that makes the Coordinated Care Initiative work for IHSS consumers the way that it should. So that is what our request is here today. Great. Well, thank you. That's very helpful. Was, um, you, you made clarity out of something I didn't totally understand as an agenda item. So okay. thank, thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, let's move on to the 7% restoration. <laughs> Welcome. Hello, uh, my name is Joseph Berry, um, here with the IHSS Coalition. And I wanna talk about the permanent uh, restoration of the 7%. Um, currently, I liken it to uh, a bully at school, right? Um, presently, of course, the 7% has been temporarily or uh, you know pulled back, or I mean, provided back, and like I said, I liken it to a bully being that, um, you know, the, 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 the bully, the, the teachers may have come between the bully and myself here at this point, but he's still in the same class, right? It's, it's, still, it's still hanging over my head a little bit. And uh, to bring it full circle, yesterday um, I, was, I was asking my son, I said, hey, hey son, what do you guys want for dinner? You and your sister want for dinner tonight? And he, and, and he responded to me, he said, well, well dad, how, are, are you sore or how are you feeling? And it didn't hit me right away immediately, but at first I chastised him a little bit. I said, hey, don't worry about what, you know, how I'm feeling. You're, you're the child and, and just worry about what you want to eat. I'll let you know if I'm not feeling well enough as far as the implications for what we're going to eat. And it went back and I started to think about how that tied in to this here because this, the 7% for me, I get about 140 hours a month uh, on um, IHSS, right? So if you think about 7% equals out to almost 10 hours, about 9.8 hours. Um, seems kind of arbitrary, if you will, given in that context, but if you think about what almost 10 hours for me is almost two days worth of work. And while those cuts are implemented, it means such things as choosing between having ramens or some microwave pizza or something for dinner and actually having like, you know, a good meal, you know, home cooked, you know, meal that takes good 20, 30 minutes at least to make. So when my son asked me how was I feeling, he, he, was, he, was, he, was, he was kind of a roundabout way asking me, you know, are we gonna have a ramen type of meal tonight or, is, or are we gonna have some food? And so, you know, to make a long story short, those are the types of things that um, a 7% cut 
uh, you know, puts onto myself and, and my family indirectly. But the, 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 the thing is, it's great that, that it's not being implemented currently. I would like to see it done away with, you know, completely taken off the table for the, for the, for the future period. Thank you, and I appreciate the picture you painted for us. Uh, sounds like you have a perceptive son. Um, <laughs> yeah, too perceptive. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. It only gets more perceptive as they get older. But, uh, thank you. Um, let me see if there are any comments from uh, the department in response to any of these proposals for investment. No, very, very Pete Chervinka again from the department very quickly. Uh, I think we covered the 7% restoration earlier in the remarks between Department of Finance and ourselves. We hope to have an update at the May revision. Uh, in terms of the CMIPS2 programming for additional hours under the co uh, Coordinated Care Initiative, um, it, it's in the statute, it's, it's allowed. Uh, last year, legislation that would have required this was, was vetoed by the governor given the funding uncertainty absent the MCO tax that was facing the program. To the extent that folks wanted to fund this, uh, we would want careful consideration made in terms of, as, as Ms. Rutledge alluded to, we have FLSA upgrades going, we have some core system maintenance that has to happen, we have some software upgrades to maintain the integrity of the payroll system. So as in most IT systems, we would like to better understand and have a conversation about where best to insert this additional workload in, into the work plan for the system. And on the IHSS share of cost buyout program, um, Memories at this point are fading. I can't anymore remember the value of the savings that were created there, but we would be happy to respond back to the committee if the committee was interested with some of the historical documents and estimates Thank you. around that. I think that'd be appreciated. LAO, any comment on these proposals? We don't have an official position on any of these proposals, but are learning about them and are available to your Office for Technical Assistance. Great, thank you, and Department of Finance? Thank you. Um, well, I want to thank the panel members for uh, helping us focus and also for being concise this afternoon. We are going to now move to public comment on issue items 7 through 10, uh, the IHSS issues that we've heard testimony on. Uh, could I get a show of hands how many are planning on testifying? I think we see the line and out of respect for everyone and, and the distance we still have to go on this agenda today, would ask you to try to stay at about one minute um, and out of respect for everyone getting the opportunity to, uh, to be heard by the committee this afternoon. Uh, so with that, we'll go to our, our first public comment. Thank you for your patience. Good afternoon. My name is Michelle Rousey. I'm the chair of the Public Authority for IHSS and Al of the Advisory Board in Alameda County. Um, I, you know, the word "gotcha" came up today on, on the overtime, and and I and, and I do feel that it, it is a gotcha in some way because, you know, as long as it was for for you to explain all the exceptions and everything else here today, do you really ex expect our workers who are bilingual and, and, a, and, and speak different languages to understand all those processes in, in a timely manner? Um, and, you know, and, and the other thing is, is to call in to have those ex exemptions taken off um, to call into our county is is almost impossible to get a hold of a person. So you know, I just want you to be aware of what you're asking our providers to do. It, it, it's it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be easy for you to implement. It's not going to be easy for them to get off a violation. Um, okay. Um, you are pretty much up against time, but I see you have a companion with you, so I'm going to afford, I'm going to consider that you're speaking on behalf of your companion. Now, now's the time to have a, a level playing field for um, our services and programs, and for the MCO techs, um, you know, <laughs> I would make sure that you have that that it's not on the table, like you said, and, and also that we find a permanent solution to that. Because right now, every time we look over our shoulders, we're we're trying we're 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 concerned that that 
tax is going to come back, and we're not going to have those hours of service this is that we need. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thanks to your companion. Thank you, Chairman uh, Monty. I really appreciate the time to talk. My name is Connie Arnold again. I'm from Elk Grove. I'm a disability rights advocate. Um, I'm on IHSS, and I'm on a waiver. I'm on the NFAH waiver, personal care services. And I want to testify on several issues. First is that the 7% IHSS cut uh, needs to be permanently restored with or without the MCO tax. That's a short and sweet, okay? That impacts people's ability to have the care they need. The Medi-Cal buyout, which Deborah Doctor had been speaking about, or IHSS share of cost issue, as every, however you want to call it, uh, that is very important because many individuals with disabilities who have worked or persons uh, that are seniors have a level of share of cost now that it makes them reduce their amount to live on to $600, as Deborah was saying. And that's a problem that is pushing people into nursing homes because they can't afford to maintain their own home and live. You know, the cost of, of things is going up above what people on SSI get, and that's what we've already addressed here. So it's really very important for individuals to be able to live in the community for you to restore that Medi-Cal uh, IHSS share of cost buyout. Um, additionally, on the um, IHSS overtime issue, this IHSS overtime 66 hours cap and the limited event, uh, exemptions avail are, that are available and if you even know about them, and I'm here today to learn about one of them that I really wasn't aware of and I keep asking this question as a recipient and I can't get any specific answers and they're saying that the exemptions are associated with the providers and not the recipients and yet you have a high level of care need and this is a problem. So for an individual uh, with a disability, significant disability on both IHSS and IHO waiver services, um, the hours cap needs to be 84 hours because the other issue is that you're allowed to have a worker work for you 12 hours a day. But now my mobility and my ability to travel is also being impacted by the fact that if you go 12 hours times seven days, that's 84 hours. So um, it's impacting whether a person can get their van repaired, where they need to go to get it, do a stu student internship, Thank be able you. to I whatever they I appreciate do. the examples you've gone. I gave you uh, some letters. I was gonna acknowledge that, Ms. Arnold, thank you. Some of the sentences kind of like, I rushed to write that this morning. I, I ran out the door thinking I probably missed the hearing already. Well, it was, we appreciate what you've provided the committee. It's very thorough and I wanna thank you. We do have that and I've been so, reading it. I appreciate that. So I'm gonna rework it, but thank you very much. Thank you, we appreciate your testimony and the written materials you provided us. And anybody can submit written testimony or written materials that become part of the committee record. Uh, and I am gonna ask that we move to the, out of, out of respect for the many people that do wanna testify. Thank you, Ms. Arnold. And if I could ask people if you've, if you can be conscious of everyone who wants to testify, maybe pick one issue, or if the issues have been addressed by others, just sign on, say I'm in agreement with what's been shared today. Thank you. Hi. Um, my name is Nelson Rituya, a UDW IHSS worker from Roseville, uh, Placer County. I am taking care of my um, ex-mother-in-law, 90 years old with Alzheimer's and dementia. I'm here today to uh, the newly approved overtime and travel time and medical wait time for IHSS provider. Um, like me, it's very vital for our day-to-day -day living. That is why we have to fight long and hard for it. I am here today to urge you to extend the current grace period for the implementation of the program violation from May 1st to September 1st, so that we have more time to make sure every provider understands the complicated new rules. It isn't fair if a provider is issued a violation 
for a role they did not understand or know about completely. Thank you, sir. We appreciate your testimony. Thank you for your work. Appreciate it. Yes, ma'am. Uh, hi, my name is Katrina Buchel. I take care of my brother, Randy, the one the fish at. <laughs> he can't talk. He's 59 years old. He's a mute. Um, I do everything for him. I am pledging for, to please restore everything we all deserve. We work very, very hard what we do. I'm not using this, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. And everything. Um, we do the exact same thing as nurses and doctors. He, because we promised our mom on her deathbed she would not, he would not go to a nursing home. I used to work in one. I would never recommend one. Yeah. Thank you. Well, we appreciate your service. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. My name is Lisa Scott. I'm from El Dorado County, and I provide for three uh, women. I'm also with the UDW Ask Me 3930. Because of the 7%, our hours got cut. I was not able to go to my client's, Adele's house every day. So one day I decided to stop by and I found her blue and comatose in her bathtub. I then called 911, put her oxygen on. And um, as soon as I got down to the hospital, they told me that if I had been a half hour late, uh, she'd be dead. She wouldn't be here with us today. So I am here today to ask you to please restore the 7% permanently. Thank you. Thank you. And sounds like thank you for your life-saving care for your, for your client. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Lydia Rodriguez. I am from Stanislaus County, and I take care of my son. I'm also a home care provider, an IHSS employee. I take care of my son, Icy Rodriguez, who is paralyzed chest down. I also take care of Barbara Gill, which has MS and she's also in a wheelchair. And let me tell you, the 7% cut to our home care clients, IHSS hours were harmful to the seniors and people with disabilities that need every minute of our care. Ending the cut last year was a relief and it showed that our elected leaders value the health and safety of home care recipients and that they respect the job we home care providers do. It also meant we no longer had to make impossible choices about care, you know, what to cut. And our clients now get every single hour they assessed in order to stay healthy, safe, and live independently in their homes. So today I am here to strongly urge you to make the restoration of the 7% cut permanent for next year's budget so we can end this once and for all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for being here today. Good afternoon. My name is Rosalia Rodriguez. I have 20 years on doing in-home care, and I've lost all my clients, uh, but uh, they've all been taken care of in their own home. One thing, last, when they took our 7% away from us, it was really hard. I'm on Social Security. I have to live, and then Social Security cuts um, my whole entire SSI check because I make more than um, $1,000 when I had to take care of my clients. So you'd, you lose either which way. It doesn't make any difference because living um, paycheck to paycheck is not an easy task. We're, we're um, saving the state lots of money from keeping these people out of the uh, convalescent homes and nursing homes also. So I urge you and the rest of your committee to please restore our 7% because it was ours to begin with. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. I'm Farah McDade-Ting with the California State Association of Counties, representing all 58 of California counties. I just wanted to align myself on issues seven and eight with CWDA's and Ms. Senderling's comments. There are two very highly technical issues. On the overtime implementation, I think September 1st is a reasonable date to ask for a delay. And on the MOE issue, it's a very small issue. The department has worked with us as well as Department of Finance, and we're confident we'll get that resolved. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Benita Munoz and I'm from Sonoma County and I support the overtime proposal and the restoration of the 7% and 
and that the deadline should be out to September the 1st. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. My name is Jose Ruiz and I, uh, I'm also from Sonoma County and represent the uh, SEIU 2015 and I also support the uh, overtime proposal and I would like the 7% uh, 7, 7 to be permanently restored. Thank you very much. Thanks for your presence. Hi, it's me again. Um, I support the overtime and the proposal of the permanent 7% restoration. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Salinas. Libby Sanchez on behalf of the California Association of Public Authorities for In-Home Supportive Services. I want to start by aligning myself with the comments made by Ms. Senderling McDonald and Ms. Doctor. Um, of primary importance to us is the delay in um, in, in penalties being imposed until September 1st while the um, you know thousands of errors um, may be small on the grand scale of the number of providers and the number of consumers because um, consumer choice is a fundamental precept in IHSS. It's imperative that a provider not be terminated. And while there are so many kinks in the armor, um, as have been pointed out um, in the recommendations we've provided, both the committee and the departments for some tinkering that have to occur, um, until those tinkers have been implemented, we're very, very concerned that providers will be terminated and consumers will be left without choice. Thank you. My name is Rachel Hagan, Sacramento Home Care, and I just want to say that I support the 7% restoration and the overtime. Thank you very much. Good morning. My name is Lana Nguyen. I come from uh, Santa Rosa, San Jose in home care. I come here today to support for overtime and please don't cut 7%. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> 